Last year I made this video about updating Batman's no kill rule to a no murder rule. And some months ago this year, Tristan and Bianca decided to cover it over on Tristan's channel Nerds Newsstand. Long story short, they skipped over the opening disclaimer where I made it clear I never wanted to make Batman start killing people, and so they ended up getting the wrong idea. However, both Tristan and Bianca did recognize the work I had put into that video, and among their compliments they also said that I sound like I want to suck their blood. That then gave me the idea to take on another look at Batman Vampire Trilogy from the 1990s, especially when I used one panel from it in the thumbnail of the rule update video. So... The Batman Vampire Trilogy consists three graphic novels written by Dove Mock and drawn by Kelly Jones. Those three graphic novels include Batman and Dracula Red Rain, published in 1999, Bloodstorm in 1994, and Crimson Mist in 1998. As the name of the initial story suggests, it involved Batman going up against Bram Stoker's Dracula, but to keep the narrative more interesting, Red Rain was designated as an Elseworld story set outside of the established canon, similar to Superman Red Sun and Gotham by Gaslight. It was set in Earth 43, by the way. And since Bram Stoker created Dracula in 1897, he was pretty much a public domain character by 1999 when the first story of the trilogy was made. And the popularity of Red Rain then led to DC Comics to commission it the two sequels. Then in 2005, DC Comics and Warner Bros. Animation made an inspired adaptation of the first two stories with the Batman vs. Dracula, but I will talk about that much later. And like with my recent comic to adaptation comparison reviews, Robert helped me once again in going over the trilogy in explaining some aspects of it that could have gone in one ear and out the other for a dyslectic like me. Let's start with the Red Rain and work our way up from it to the rest of the trilogy and what DC ended up doing with it after it ended. Take note of the time codes for the individual stories and now let's get started. The first story of the trilogy opens in Gotham with a foreign tourist being approached by a lady of the night seeing him as a wealthy mark. But instead the foreigner declares that he won't be giving anything to her. As he then reveals his fangs, the foreigner lunges at the poor woman's throat and then cuts twin slashes across it to hide her true cause of death for those who will eventually find her remains. In the next day, we are introduced to Bruce Wayne in his second year as Batman, with his daily sleeping schedule having him dream of a woman coming to his bed as he sleeps and doing weird stuff to him before Bruce wakes up. As he is shown getting ready to head out as Batman, the story also establishes a homeless man being harassed by the police, and by the time Batman has reached Gotham in his rather interestingly styled Batmobile, that might as well be a motorcycle because of the lack of windshield to protect him from the wind resistance, the homeless man is attacked by a monstrous being after his blood. And by the time Batman arrives at the scene, the homeless man is dead with similar twin slash marks on his throat. In the following daytime scene, Commissioner Gordon is shown talking about the 19 similar murder cases with Gotham's very first Black Mayor, who wants Gordon to deal with them on a full-scale investigation that will be kept hidden from the media to protect the mayor's chances of re-election. Then Bruce is shown dreaming of the woman coming to his bed again and telling him that her kind are real. Those news seem to make him happy and more vigorous in going out as Batman again, because this time he manages to catch an attacker in the act and learn that he is seriously underleveled against these opponents as he is fought back and fled away from. This encounter still helps the investigation on the attacks as the latest victim did not get her throat slashed and has clear puncture wounds in her neck. And it makes Batman so much more focused on the case that he tells Alfred to cancel all of his Bruce Wayne activities before going to sleep again, so he can dream of the woman once more, who this time tells him that vampires are real, but not all of them evil. 
That direct message wakes Bruce up and makes him feel like he needs to balance out his double life a little. But when he is about to enter his car, Bruce ends up without realizing to tear away the door handle and realize that his strength has increased. Naturally, this causes him to go see a doctor for a health checkup and be told that the blood work will take some time to come in. However, when examining Bruce's back, his doctor recognizes some abnormalities that are kept from the reader to see for now. Next we have a scene on the ground, where the foreigner now referred to as the master is brought runaways whom no one is going to miss. Then Batman is shown visiting a female character only shown to exist in this continuity as the closest thing he has to an expert on vampires. As this Batman is younger and in the early years of his career, this plot device named Ariane is used to exposit information on the strengths and weaknesses of the vampires, as well as how they can be created and harmed. The one thing Batman wants to know for sure is if vampires have to be evil, or if they can have a choice at being the predators that they supposedly are. After leaving Ariane, Batman goes to investigate a graveyard for the lower caste with desecrated graves that leave a trail for Batman to follow to an underground access. As he begins to open it with the new strength he has discovered, a storm arises with red rain that Batman can feel stinging him, which makes Batman further question what is happening to not just to him, but also to Gotham. Underground, Batman discovers the stolen remains from the graveyard in a pool of the red rainwater as they begin to reanimate into ghouls thirsty for his blood. Realizing to be outnumbered, Batman retreats only to be surrounded by more of the beings feeding on another unfortunate victim and is so forced to defend himself. His chances are rather poor, until the arrival of people firing stakes at the ghouls while chanting TO DEATH IN PEACE. They are led by a very 90s dressed up woman, whom Batman recognizes as the same one who has been visiting his dreams, and confirms it by repeating her words. Vampires are real, but not all of them evil. The woman gets to introduce herself to Batman as Tanya, right before the head vampire arrives to use his influence to make them end themselves. However, Batman without tools or methods to do so manages to break free from the head vampire's influence and attacks the beast by telling Tanya and her followers to leave. This angers the head vampire, who quickly manages to overpower Batman and wound him, but remembering his meeting with Ariane, Batman uses his own blood to draw a cross to the wall next to him, and so they remain in a standstill until the sun rises to shine down to the sewers, forcing the head vampire to retreat, promising he will have Batman's blood the next day meet. As Batman is shown struggling to return home, Commissioner Gordon is shown struggling to make sense of the latest victim have different wounds, and Alfred is shown to discover how the tap water has been tainted undrinkable by the red rain, so making him do with bottled mineral water instead. Through this transitioning, Bruce is once again shown waking from his dreams with Tanya still in his bed, revealing that she had been giving him her blood instead of taking any of his. Tanya explains this to be a precaution for the enemy they both have, and Bruce can now deduce it to be Dracula himself. According to Tanya, Dracula has been able to remain hidden and raise his power in Gotham by going after undesirables that no one would miss, with herself having been turned by him many years ago, and only begun to oppose him after children being added to their list of prey. This caused Tanya to remember her old life and flee from Dracula's will to live in the forests of Europe feeding on animals until she was again sane enough to start working on a placebo serum that would help her keep her blood addiction from reducing her back to what she had escaped from. Tanya shared this serum with other victims of Dracula like herself, and for centuries they would hunt him until he had arrived to Gotham. 
Here, Dracula seemed to have changed his way to almost as if he didn't care about getting caught. And because Tanya with her followers were once Dracula's victims, she sought out Bruce in hopes of making Batman more powerful to be able to resist and oppose Dracula's influence unlike them. The two spend the rest of the night planning, until in the morning, Bruce tells Alfred to deliver a message to Commissioner Gordon to meet up with him and Tanya, so the Commissioner can be shared with this information, and through a demonstration with Tanya, proven that vampires are a real threat with Dracula leading them. With Batman and Tanya still making plans, Gordon leaves promising to share this information via a press conference, but as he is shown leaving, Dracula is shown flying above and following him. As Bruce is given more of Tanya's blood to empower his own natural abilities, she reveals to him that Dracula has taken his friend, not Alfred who is still safely at Wayne Manor, and lets Bruce know that the results of his blood work have come in now, revealing that his blood now has abnormal adrenaline levels, increased white cell count, and some unknown antibodies we don't get to hear as vampires attack the Wayne Manor. When they refuse to stay down with the usual methods, Bruce comes to realize that the killing the undead in self-defense is not murder, and stakes the goose to let them out of their miseries. The sight of it causes Alfred to realize what Bruce's blood test results meant, and a timely television report makes Bruce realize that it was Commissioner Gordon who was taken by Dracula. As Bruce leaves to go out as Batman, he tells Alfred to stick with the plans he has made with Tanya and meet him elsewhere later. Underground in Dracula's domain, Commissioner Gordon is told by the Count that the blood he has been drinking from the people of Gotham is tainted. And having consumed it, Dracula can now feel his once sophisticated and aristocratic mind having decayed down to the same level as Gotham's native monsters, with his remaining self-awareness wanting to avenge this corruption to Gotham, starting with Gordon with whom Dracula flies into the night, explaining all this and leaving his underlings behind to be ambushed by Batman. Having pre-planned how to deal with them, Batman leads the vampires to another ambush by Tanya and her followers, which forces the vampires to be diverted to flee the underground tunnels into the Batcave. As the two factions of vampires fight down in the Batcave, Batman makes his way up to the Wayne Manor to secure himself in a protective pod and blow up his home as the sun rises to shine its light down to burn all of the vampires into ashes, including Hadia. With the destruction of Wayne Manor, Bruce Wayne is believed to have died in a cave in swallowing the manor, with Bruce himself later leaving his protective part to remember Tanya's final verse to him as he mourns her death. But Dracula still remains to taunt Bruce that their feud is not over yet. Still, he is allowed to walk to his new home in town, with Alfred waiting to be told what the plan was and will be in going forward. With this brownstone in Gotham, Batman will be closer to all the action he needs to be involved with, and now with Tanya's vampire blood transfusions having taken the required effect, Batman won't be needing a Batmobile anymore, as Tanya's blood has helped him grow wings of his own. With these upgrades making him a literal creature of the night, Batman departs to his final confrontation with Dracula to rescue Commissioner Gordon, and as his faithful butler, Alfred follows as a needed medic. In Gotham Cathedral, Dracula awaits for Batman to arrive while keeping Commissioner Gordon alive by slowly draining him of his blood to a chalice to drink out of to make sure he won't rise as his skin, while instead having infected the bats in the belfry to keep everyone else from reaching them and discourage further approaches. Then Batman arrives with a storm and engages Dracula in combat while releasing Commissioner Gordon as Dracula taunts them both with his long 
own liberty, and how Tanya died for nothing because of Batman. Batman fights back with the revelation of what Tanya had made him as well as with Batarangs made of silver that moves their fight outside of the cathedral as Alvin follows them. They fight in the sky as the storm rages, but while Tanya had given Batman the abilities, he himself neglected to reinforce his costume to protect his body from Dracula's fangs biting into Batman's flesh as the Count starts to drink his blood. While this is happening, the storm causes a lightning to strike a power line pole and sharpen it into a stake. With one more silver batarang, Batman manages to weaken Dracula long enough to push him down to it and end the undead vampire's reign. With probably the leftover electricity or at the distant rising sun burning Dracula to ashes in the wind. The evil looming over Gotham has so been vanquished, but Batman himself is still badly wounded and bleeding so much that by the time Alfred finds him, he does not have a pulse anymore. A week later, Mayor Woods resigns from his position while also confessing to criminal neglect charges brought by keeping Dracula's actions under wraps, and Alfred Pennyworth has been left as the sole executor of the Wayne fortune after Bruce Wayne's supposed death, or just a tenth of it with the brownstone, while the other 90% of it is put to fund housing for the homeless people, who were Dracula's initial victims, along with that lady of the night. The first story of the trilogy ends with Alfred tending to Batman's remains under the brownstone, where he witnesses Batman rising back up and bearing his new fangs, showing that while Bruce Wayne is dead, Batman can still go on forever now, fully as a vampire. The second story of the trilogy opens with Batman preying on the regular criminals as before, who will now become more superstitious and cowardly enough in witnessing him being bulletproof and faster than before as a vampire. While going through business as usual, he also hunts down the rest of Dracula's crew who still survive from the previous story and puts them out of their misery with stakes to their hearts. As the vampire Batman keeps himself busy, and another individual has made it his business to find the rest of Dracula's surviving family, and by adapting his usual methods to deal with their kind, the Joker is able to fearlessly blackmail and negotiate with the vampires in hiding to take their chances by putting him in charge of them. With his wicked sense of humor and knowledge of Gotham's underworld, the Joker promises to guide them away from under Batman's watchful eye and make them act more like a scalpel than a hammer. Represented by a vampire named Gretsch, the vampires agree to follow the Joker. While Commissioner Gordon is still recovering from his time as Dracula's last hostage by having thrown himself into his work, and with his knowledge of vampires being real, Gordon can deduce that a headless mutilated corpse with a stake in its heart to have been a victim of the vampires that has been prevented from coming back as one of them, while his non divisor subordinates see it as a victim of a serial killer. In fact, Batman has confessed without confessing on being this serial killer to him, and they have justified this necessity for now, until the GCPD knows where the vampires' nests are to be properly purged. Around this time, Batman also returns to his and Alfred's brownstone for the placebo serum that Tanya had created as a blood substitute to quench his hunger, not very well as he is a full vampire now with a thirst for the real thing. It is for this reason why Batman also has thrown himself into his work in hunting down the remaining vampires, and Alfred proves his worth by presenting him with new throwable stakes with silver interiors to make them more efficient. Batman's bloodlust is still tormenting his psyche to the point where his dreams are plagued with him feeding on Tanya's memory. In transitioning from the previous scene, the Joker and his vampires have managed to grow their numbers covertly to the point where Grinch has become his lieutenant. 
and now is the time when they move on to higher ranked victims. Like the rivaling Cardona crime family that the Joker sends Scratch to attack, feed, and turn so he can take over their bases and operations, while the turned victims are in undeath forced to move into burial crypts, where Batman eventually finds them to be put down. The job is however made harder for him this time, as the last one of Cardona's calls Batman out for what he has become, and not being too much different from the other vampires just because he doesn't drink blood yet. The last Cardona justifies his accusation by saying he used to be a hematophobic before being turned, and now the sight of blood has the exact opposite reaction to him, meaning that it is only the matter of time before Batman succumbs like he did, and no amount of denial can stop it as Batman stakes the last Cardona and cuts off his head. This still causes Batman to question how long and how far he can take his undead existence, knowing what Cardona told him to be true. He is a monster now, and as Mr. Lord himself famously put it, that question is then answered with the introduction of not yet Catwoman version of Selina Kyle, whom Gretsch decides to stalk in his free time in the night. And like animal playing with his food, Gretsch turns himself into a wolf while hunting Selina and even manages to bite her once catching her on a bridge, where she falls down to the river where the running water protects her from creatures like Gretsch. Still, as Selina was bitten but didn't get her blood sucked out of her, she now carries a form of infection that reveals itself when the moon rises to reveal her new form as a werecat. Meanwhile, Gretsch has gone to lead the other vampires to take over more influence for the Joker from other crime bosses. The target this time being a pimp named Manny the Shark and his women, whom Batman is eventually pointed at, and while fighting Manny before putting him down, Batman catches a glimpse of the Joker, and seeing him casually socializing with the vampires, makes him deduce the clown prince of crime to be behind the vampire's change of tactics. Get out of here! Find some other kind of job! And now that the Joker has also seen Batman taking out his turned vampires, it is not too long before he also learns that his nemesis has become one of the undead as well. Seeing his actions being bad for the business they are doing, the Joker murders a priest to take over the church he looked after, so he can turn the holy place into a trap for the Batman, who around the same time comes into contact with the werecat woman looking for the one who turned her and being mistaken for Gretsch. By using her verse when overpowered, Selina not only manages to explain herself to Batman and make him see that they are in a way the same with what has happened to them, as well as be shocked at discovering how she has the willpower not to lust after blood. In his denial of this, as well as to her willingness to help him in hunting the one who did this to her, Batman tells her to leave before returning home to work on Tanya's blood substitute, of which effect has now begun to lose its effect on helping Batman control his thirst for blood. In his desperation, Batman visits the plot device named Ariane to consult her on if Selina as a werecat woman can be trusted, as she herself is shown stalking him, and Ariane's knowledge on the matter leaves Batman validated with his experiences. However, his next injury about controlling a vampire's bloodlust with or without help causes him to lose his composure, and Ariane can save herself from Batman's wrath by telling him to get laid. But in his desperation, Batman can only bellow in self-pity and lash out to Alfred on how his placebo drug is not helping him resist the bloodlust anymore, which causes Batman to send his faithful servant away, so Alfred won't become his victim or see him at this low. While Alfred goes to share Batman's mental descent to Commissioner Gordon, Batman takes Ariane's advice and goes to see Selina on the roofs again, who selflessly brings him to her home, where this scene would look very suspect when out of context, in which they just sleep together with her unclothed and Batman fully dressed. As they sleep, Alfred and Gordon are shown to be worried about where Batman is, and the vampires are preparing a feast for themselves. 
which will be happening later when Batman and where Catwoman have rested and are at their full strength to fight and put the vampires down, while also making sure their victims won't come back as new vampires. With Selina's help, Batman is now more clear-headed to think strategically in acknowledging the Joker's part in leading the vampires, and having turned Gotham's crime families, Batman can pass this information to Commissioner Gordon, who had already previously told Batman to have put a team together, and have them put down all the vampires during the daytime, while Batman and the Werecat won't sleep together. It makes a mockery of every rule in the book. He said you would say that. And his response? The book has no chapter on vampires. This plan of action brings the vampires' numbers in Gotham down to just 15, and with the Joker still leading them, he plans to use them to lure Batman into an ambush where the surviving vampires are armed with crossbows. Still, even if this was a human Batman and human Catman versus human ghouls, Batman is able to disarm and finish the vampires, while Selina pays a scratch as the vampire who turned her into a bear Catwoman, and gets her vengeance, leaving the Joker as the last man standing. So the Joker takes his last obvious option in doing things himself, and shoots a stake at Batman's back, but tragically, Selina jumps in to take the stake for him, and dies leaving Batman alone without her companionship keeping him sane. Filled with grief, Batman chases after the Joker, and is led to a church that the Joker had prepared as a proper trap for a vampire, which Batman does not fully qualify as seeing how he has kept himself from drinking human blood, so the crosses and holy butter have have no effect on him. But with Selina as his comfort companion now killed by the Joker, Batman is slowly slipping down into that direction, and after breaking the Joker's neck with a backhanded swing, his fangs are drawn into it, and not even a fleeting moment of restraint can keep Batman from letting the Joker have his final victory. Now Batman is fully done to be a vampire no better than Dracula with the crosses and the holy water hurting him now. And after making sure that the Joker will not rise to be another vampire like him, Batman flees back to his sanctuary while leaving Alfred and Commissioner Gordon with clear instructions how to proceed now. The second story of the trilogy ends with the faithful butler and the police commissioner driving a stake through their friend's heart, leaving him to experience death in peace forever. The third and final part of the trilogy opens with Batman's remains, decomposing in his crypt after being staked by Alfred and Gordon four or so years ago. And during all that time, Batman has laid there unable to move, while also aware of his predicament and doubled with his vampiric thirst for blood. This state of false death foreshadows a dangerous warning of what would become if he were to be released from it, with fateful Butler Alfred's recurring nightmares of putting him into it also warning how likely that will be. At the same time, Harvey Dent is released from the hospital after being turned into Two-Face, Killer Croc is shown preying on the people of Gotham, and Scarecrow is going after those who bullied him as Jonathan Crane with extreme prejudice. As the red rain still remains to pour down, Commissioner Gordon visits Alfred to discuss about these rogues having appeared now when Batman is gone, and these versions of the Penguin, Poison Ivy, Two-Face, Scarecrow, 
Killer Croc and even the Riddler in this story are such exaggerations that after Gordon leaves, Alfred goes down to release a shadow of Batman's former self. Literally, as with all the years decomposing and thirsting for blood after drinking the Jokers, Batman is now a monster with a black heart whose head should have been cut off to make him really dead, but he still holds himself back from attacking Alfred by the news of these new villains. And so the crimson mist begins to spread around Gotham, as the now fully monstrous vampire Batman goes after his villains one by one. Starting with the heads and blood of the Penguin and his men, which seems to balance him enough to meet with Commissioner Gordon and Alfred about finding the Riddler next, and letting them know exactly what he will do to the criminals playing Gotham. Next target on Batman's list is the Riddler, whose appearance in this story must have inspired both Tom King and Matt Reeves decades later. And then the Scarecrow, whose fear toxin does nothing against the undead vampire Batman is now. His rampage eventually causes the still surviving criminals, not waiting for their turns to be next, to make plans to stay alive, with Two-Face proposing that they team up with the law enforcement, where the nature of that alliance being determined by his coin landing on its guard side. And then Batman is shown going after Poison Ivy, where he makes her death be an example of tasting her own medicine, in making her go through the same seduction she does to her victims before giving her the kiss of death. Poison Ivy's death is recognized by Commissioner Gordon and Alfred as Batman having become a selective predator to whom killing has become a second nature. They now know that they eventually need to put Batman down once he is done, and that is when they are approached by Two-Face and Killer Croc to propose that alliance to give Batman the release of death he would otherwise likely give to them. The former district attorney understands that the police commissioner might not give a definitive answer yet, so he and Croc leave them with the time to think with a reminder of how they did not kill them when they could have. Immediately Alfred and Gordon realize that this alliance has to happen, so they won't end up sacrificing GCPD officers or federal agents out of their deaths. As they consider their options, and Alfred reveals that Batman has not come to spend his days resting in his brownstone crypt, Batman is shown attacking Black Mask and his false face society, without mentally acknowledging what he is doing, as he also heard Two-Face's proposal to Alfred and Gordon and thinking about the future while killing Black Mask, whose head along with his men are then taken to be put on stakes, facing Blackgate Penitentiary to warn its sane criminals when they see them in the morning. During the day, Alfred and Gordon go to confirm that Batman has moved to spend his resting hours in the ruins of his old Batcave to know where to move against their former friend, and on the next night, Batman moves against the confined inmates of Arkham Asylum, first taking their blood and then their heads, which the Asylum Director Jeremiah Arkham apathetically ignores as it happens, even when his attending orderly witnesses Amygdala, the Mad Hatter, Cornelius Sturk, and Victor Zass killed and beheaded. At the end of the night, Jeremiah is told to go home as he no longer has a job, and Gordon tells Alfred it is the time they join forces with Two-Face and Killer Croc while they can still be worked with. And so they descend to the depths of the Batcave for the final confrontation, armed with crossbows and wooden stakes. Their plan is simple, set explosives to the thinnest cave ceilings, lure Batman to them during the daytime, and blow it open for sunlight to burn Batman away. However, as he is still Batman, he learns of their plan by hiding nearby, and for the last time visits Ariane that night for a final consultation on if he can truly be laid to rest. But ultimately, Batman leaves in frustration without confirmation of her survival.
Now Batman is left to ponder his options while reflecting on the past with Selina's lost comfort and Tanya's support as well as the future. How he has fallen into being a selective predator with only two acceptable preys left with Two-Face and Killer Croc. And how eventually his vampiric thirst for blood will force him to prey on the innocents he once protected or start to take pride to form his own vampiric family like Dracula. It. The desperation is felt real, as Batman realizes that soon there will be no one left to stop him anymore. In the morning, Alfred and Gordon have blocked the Batcave's entrance with a cross where they plan to have a last stand if they survive that long. So Alfred goes to darker tunnels to call out his former master into a trap he already knows about and is more than able to avoid the wooden stakes fired at him. But when trying to feast on Killer Croc, the villain's hide proves itself too tough to bite through, and when forced to fight him, Batman leaves himself exposed to be shot to the back by Gordon, and once again falls into the same catatonic state as before, where Croc pushes him down to the abyss. But as Gordon and Alfred are ignoring that Batman is technically alive down there, Two-Face and Croc decide to act on his coin landing on its car side and turn on their allies. As Gordon defends himself from Two-Face's men, Alfred flees from Killer Croc deeper into the cave and discovers his weakened master, and the old faithful manages to convince Batman to take his blood as his last victim to gain strength to save Gordon from Two-Face and Killer Croc. So Batman takes Alfred's blood and uses his cut-off hair to lure Croc into an ambush where he refuses to take the villain's blood, and then confronts Two-Face in returning fired shots at him, one for each of his faces. Now only Batman and Gordon remain, and with Alfred's blood keeping him sane enough, Batman tells Gordon exactly what will happen if the police commissioner will not stop him, and ultimately tells him to either kill him or join him as another monster. Once Gordon tells him where the detonator is, Batman throws him away with orders to let the sun shine on him. But tragically, the cave-in is greater than expected, and so the police commissioner is buried under the rocks, leaving Batman alone between the sunlight and the darkness of his cave. With his allies and enemies all dead now, Batman has with a heavy price done what he set out to accomplish in the first place, but now he is the last monster left to threaten the innocent. So as his final heroic act, Batman walks out of his cave into the sunlight, finally reaching the peace he has been looking for since his transformation. Okay, since it took this long to reach the end, you can probably guess why the Batman vs Dracula will be its own separate movie review. Anyway, with this Elseworld story, I think the best way to describe it is as your typical fall from grace, in seeing how we start with your regular year 2 or year 3 Batman who does not have a Robin yet, and see him fall from what he used to be after being turned into a vampire. And that must have been a conscious choice, as the writer Doug Monk tends to have a reputation in having written Batman with your typical Bat God method where he is made to look good or be praised by the other characters. That is likely why we so had a year 2 or year 3 Batman at an earlier stage of his career before Robins, to show his lack of experience that an older Batman would have, and was shown to struggle with his vampirism in the second story. Had this been a status quo mainstream DC Universe story, Batman would have automatically won against Dracula and his vampires without needing to sacrifice his humanity or secret identity. Speaking of which, 
The lack of Bruce Wayne aspect before being turned into a vampire, however, somewhat made the sacrifice of Wayne Manor, Batcave and his identity feel a little whole. Like, how can you really mourn the death of Bruce Wayne if he is a non-presence and dominantly just Batman all the time? Still, this trilogy did give, almost by an accident, what it promised with a beginning, a middle and an end. Even when DC commissioned the follow-ups years after Red Rain, Doug Monk was clearly able to write onto his previous stories and make them be somewhat natural as well as escalating progression in going towards the end. And there were also some freedoms he was probably taking with how the vampires work, but the one clear aspect that Monk was able to plant early on was the type of person whose blood is consumed, ending up affecting the vampire drinking it. Dracula himself told Gordon in the first story that he was originally just passing through Gotham, and drinking the blood of its natives caused him to change into becoming more like the comic book villain he was portrayed as here. Then when Batman finally broke down to drink the Joker's blood, the story spelled out multiple times that he was becoming more and more corrupted because of the Joker's blood, followed by the third story where he drank the blood of the rest of his enemies, where he seemed to become worse and worse. Only when Alfred offered his own blood willingly did Batman start to show actual proper restraint with willingness to allow his execution to happen to receive peace. Some of Batman's villains, however, caused me to scratch my head more than once, since they were only introduced after Batman had already turned into a vampire, and when the narrative seemed to imply that Batman had an established history with some of them. That didn't make much sense. But ultimately, what we got in the end was a fully closed-off story told from the beginning to the end. With Alfred and Gordon also dying, the story pretty much pulled a kill your darlings by not leaving any aspects of it to move forward. Or so it would have been if it wasn't for Infinite Crisis in 2005, having Alexander Luthor Jr. of Earth 3 and Superboy Prime shaking up the DC multiverse, that then caused the Vampire Batman of Earth 43 to be resurrected as a complete flanderization of his last appearance in Crimson Mist. Now he was made to be that monster he feared about becoming in Preying on the Innocence, as seen in the search for a Palmer Thine issue of Countdown, where Jason Todd, Donna Troy, and Kyle Rayner with their designated monitor driver visited Earth 43 while looking for a Palmer. It wasn't written by Doug Moink, who had stopped working for DC at the time, but Kelly Jones still did the art and it feels rushed compared to what he did in the main trilogy. Long story short, they find a dying vampire Barbara Gordon killed by Dick Grayson, whose parents were killed by the vampire Batman, and when trying to catch up to Dick trying to kill the vampire Batman, they end up distracting him to be caught, bitten and turned into a vampire Robin. Oh and Kyle was attacked by one of the vampires so that the Gotham by Gaslight issue could happen. We're outsiders, so wouldn't that be muddling? Muddling! Oh yeah, <laughs> and that's against the rules. But then, almost a decade later, DC Comics had the Convergence event happen in 2015, of which I previously spoke of in my Rise and Fall of the Super Sons video last year, where multiple pre-New 52 worlds were put against each other by Not Brainiac, and among them we had the Swamp Thing going up against the Vampire Batman. That story was once again illustrated by Kelly Jones, but written by Len Wayne, who had created the Swamp Thing, and told Alan Moore to cripple Barbara Gordon in the killing joke. TLDR. The Swamp Thing and Abby Arkine were put against the vampires led by Not Mary Queen of Blood from I Vampire, who had in a probable retelling of the trilogy taken over the vampires left in Gotham around the same time when Batman was still hunting them, but was still damned to be to at the point where he must have drank blood from someone at some point based on how he looks. And since Not Brainiac, aka Telos, had made it be that losers get wiped out, the vampire Batman was a 
aware that his vampiric world was less deserving to survive, and so agreed to team up with the Swamp Thing. Together they fought and slayed the vampires before facing off with their queen, whose beheading turned all the other vampires she had turned back into humans so they could have souls to die in peace, I suppose. Then to help Batman find his peace as he had in the original trilogy, Swamp Thing and Abby stood with him to watch the sunrise. And the Convergence also had a version of Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor go against vampiric versions of Batman's enemies, but I'm not going to talk about that here. Regardless, with this crossover with the Swamp Thing, the vampire Batman was returned back to the same peaceful ending he had at the end of the original trilogy, and I see it as a fix up to the countdown tie-ins portrayal of him. Since then, the vampire Batman has more or less been shown in fan service cameos here and there, with the recent DC vs. Vampires miniseries being completely separate from it and being its own thing. And with that, I think I can end this video talking about the comic version. The Batman vs. Dracula is again going to be its own separate movie review, which you can go watch after this video if it's done by the time you're watching this video, because they are pretty much the same video project. I watched it after getting this video script written and have recorded them both into narration like this back to back. Meaning that if it's not out yet, there is a good chance I might be editing it right now. So while you wait for me to get it ready, remember to like this video, comment whatever you have to say about it down below, share this video for other people to see, and subscribe for the following videos. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I'm doing gameplay streams so you can chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.